Paid for by IMIC Incorporated. The Cure with Amy Cabo is brought to you by IMIC Research. Life can bring many difficult situations, domestic violence, addictions, poverty, and even sexual abuse by your loved ones. Welcome, Amy Cabo and The Cure. Afternoon, and thanks for joining us today. I'm your host, Amy Cabo, and this is The Cure. I created the show as a safe space and to show that there is hope after going through difficulties, no matter what type. I'm trying to use testimonies to that effect and inviting professionals and speakers that can help with suggestions. As a survivor, I hope to inspire others, encourage transparency, and find strength in knowing that those who suffer are not alone. Those that heal against insurmountable odds do exist. We named this show The Cure for the very reason that God was the only cure for me. Your cure could be different, like Stoic philosophy. But God is used to be a focal point in the armed services, or is a focal point in the armed services, and among recovering addicts. He must be pretty good. But faith, faith is hope. Never lose faith. If you lack faith, then pray. I had no other choice. I had to have faith. Faith and prayer is what I did most of my life. And most of my life, I had two basic rules. To love and to never intentionally cause harm. I've given testimony here about how others have harmed me, my struggles in life, the abuse and betrayal. But I also wanted to give a few examples of how God has been there for me why it's all worth it, all the 25 years I unnecessarily suffered. I always felt God will provide, and boy was I challenged about that for many years. But it became too much the day that I was faced with paying a $1,000 a day to an attorney in order not to lose my daughter. I failed. I faltered. I didn't believe God could provide a $1,000 a day for this attorney. And my daughter had become everything, my reason for fighting, my reason for living. So the things I had to do sent me in a spiral down, where self-medicating with solicit and recreational drugs was my only way out of all the pain and all the guilt I felt. It wasn't long before I couldn't do those things anymore. And as scary as it was, with no attorney or resources... I took a chance with God again and gave it all to him. So God did one better. God blessed me so that I was able to recuse this general master who was about to immediately grant full custody to the abusive father now married with his own business. And I know this is a blessing because I had no legal education, no training, no legal background, and this was indeed a 24-hour notice. And the motion, I had to prepare overnight. And then, not long after that, I stayed loyal and God blessed me again with Jay Levy, a Maverick attorney, a senior partner of a very large law firm, who would then represent me for free the remaining years I was an orphaned single mother. An orphaned not because I was born that way, orphaned because everyone I knew was afraid to know me. Besides that, God had to be there for me because I was a challenged soul entrusted with the awesome opportunity of raising this beautiful child of his. After seven years of custody battles, God blessed me with the love of my life, a kindred soul, awesome father and husband, the only one I have ever married and ever will, and many more blessings did follow. It's in my book. But I say that I have suffered for more than half my lifetime, not because suffering suddenly ended. There isn't anything to suffer about anymore. That's not how it goes. Suffer never ends. Because the same daughter that I fought and sacrificed for, for so many years, now doesn't speak to me. But these days, I really don't suffer. I don't turn to drugs. I rarely worry or stress or even believe that I'm broken. Instead, I pray and trust God. And if nothing works, I still pray 
and wait patiently for it to pass. And you'll be surprised. If it doesn't bother you, it usually passes fast. (laughs) Because I am now completely convinced that God does provide. And today, I would like to talk about some of life's struggles, the consequences thereof, how we can learn to live with it, and consider it a blessing rather than a curse. Because I do believe that if there weren't bad things, there would be no recognition recognition and honor for doing the right thing. If there weren't difficult challenges, there would be little reason to trust God, get to know Him better, and grow closer to Him. And if there weren't bad times, we wouldn't learn to appreciate the good times and be encouraged to pay it forward, as we are doing. Furthermore, if we're treated badly, if we weren't treated badly, we wouldn't come to realize the importance of being kind. And today we have in our studio, I am joined by my sister, Kelly Cabot, and my husband, Boris Nikolov. Hi. Hi. Yes, and it's been a very, very challenging topic. Now we have today a psychiatrist, that's going to speak to us. Her name is Melissa Dalcher, and she's joined by her partner, Rich Whitman. Melissa is the author of a new book called A Vision for Change, How to Help Someone with Addiction or Mental Illness. Dr. Melissa Dalcher is a board-certified psychiatrist and founder of Sigma Mental Health Urgent Care based in San Antonio, Texas, Dr. Duder currently holds an appointment as clinical assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatrists at University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio. Dr. Duder has been recognized repeatedly for her clinical work and has been named a top doctor and a best of doctor as well as Texas Super Doctors Rising Star. She has also received American Registry Patient's Choice Award. And Dr. Duder has a special interest in early stage psychiatric care, differentiating serious illnesses from normal brain development and serving mental health needs of emerging adults. She's a regular blogger and the author of Stuck in the Sick Role, How Illness Can Become an Identity. Now, Richard Whitman, with over 30 years of experience, is a trusted interventionist and respected leader in the field of addiction recovery. A pioneer in the industry, Rich has been instrumental in building some of the finest treatment programs in the nation and served as a primary treatment advisor to Dr. Phil McGraw for eight seasons of the Dr. Phil Show. Rich is an independent consultant and the founder of Whitman Recovery Service. In this role, he provides maximum service to hundreds of individuals and their families every year to access the best treatment options available. Rich is a nationally certified intervention professional. He has successfully conducted well over 500 interventions throughout the United States and has made numerous television appearances. And so I'd like to welcome you. Glad to be here. Thank you so much, Dr. Deuter and Dr. Whitman. I really appreciate you guys on this show because you have very valuable information to share with our listeners. And I wanted to start off, um, I think this could go to either one of you guys because you both deal with the same, more or less, topic. But uh, most family members or friends aren't able to differentiate between substance abuse and mental illness. And when a new problem starts, it looks similar, whether it's substances or mental illness. So people need to consider what steps to take regardless. So how can we identify what substance abuse compared to mental illness? Are they one? Are they two and the same? Does one lead to the other? Yeah, so uh, um, thank you. That's a great question. I think it is very hard for people. Um, certainly, if you know that you're 
that your loved one is using substances, uh, you might suspect that any change in behavior or uh, mood or thought might be related to substance use. But really, it's important to get that loved one some medical tests to evaluate whether drugs or drug withdrawal or substance use explains what you're seeing or whether it might be something more related to mental illness. I'm not sure a layperson can tell. Yeah, yes, you'd have to be professional. Uh, I guess you can look at their social media and try to get an idea of what's going on. But it could be difficult. Go ahead. Yeah, certainly. And I think, um, you know, many times the family member has some inkling uh, that there are cases where behavior changes and they're really uh, um, just huge questions about what's happening. And so I think it depends on the course for that individual um, and how things begin. Um, But, you know, other than investigating, do they have drugs? In their personal things, are they speaking about drugs and alcohol, or did they have the the onset of something without any evidence of drug use? There's still um, a a large number of people have both issues, and so it can be difficult if someone has both a mental illness and the use of an addictive substance to know which is the problem that's causing what you're seeing. How about the environment and choice of company? Does that play a role? I'll defer that one to Rich. Yes, Rich. Yeah, I'm, I'm afraid I, I, I missed it. How much does the environment uh, play and, into and it? And the is company that, that you keep. Absolutely. Playgrounds and play, playmates play into it a whole lot. It's hard to get somebody well in a real sick system. And whether that be the family environment or that just be the area and that. In other words, it's really difficult for somebody who has gotten involved with, let's just say, cocaine, to get clean in the area where every night there's people hanging on every corner selling crack. So playmates and playgrounds are definitely um, play into the factor. So how do we remove them from that? How do we how do we help them to get further down the road from that? I understand that perfectly. When I was a young Hooters waitress, cocaine was the thing to do. And it just really le- gets you into a spiral down. And thank God, uh, thank God, God took me out of there. And I agree with that. But I've known people that just weren't so fortunate and weren't able to make it. And now they're they're even, you know, uh, they're legalizing weed and I mean marijuana. And w- my question was that if they're twin the same, does one lead to the other? Could I, a I mean, we know about cocaine and heroin, how bad they are, but how about something like marijuana? Could that lead to mental illness? Well, there's a lot of evidence. Go ahead, please, go ahead. Yeah, there's a lot of evidence that's existed actually for 30, 40 years that marijuana use in teenagers does lead to the onset of mental illness. And um, what's been known for a long time within the medical community is that there's a link to schizophrenia, um, and that's old information. This is, not, this is not new by any means, that marijuana use can be the final trigger in a vulnerable person to bring on the serious mental illness schizophrenia. We're now finding over the last 10 to 15 years a similar link with a serious bipolar disorder, um, the kind that, that becomes a serious mental illness, also has a link with. Wow, that's incredible. That's, yes, and it's good to know, is there, is it, how about the age? Does it make a difference if the, the person that's using the marijuana is young or older about the developing brain or the brain that it, has already developed? It probably does. So the most vulnerable time for the development of schizophrenia is probably between puberty. So that age varies. That might be anywhere from roughly age 10 all the way up to, you know, uh, later teenage years like 17. Anywhere between the onset of puberty and, and the final completion of the stage of brain development that begins there, which can be up to age 29. Wow. So t- 20-somethings 
are vulnerable to uh, developing mental illness if they use marijuana. Oh, wow. They're telling me it's a wrap, doctor, but I, this is very interesting. I would really like to talk more about this. And for anyone who's tuning in, I'm your. this is The Cure. You're listening to, and I'm your host, Amy Cabo. This show is focusing on mental illness and addiction. If you suffer from persistent depression, call Neurosciences Medical Clinic to schedule a free consultation for new effective FDA-approved treatments such as intranasal ketamine or Neurostar TMS, a no-medication treatment. Neurosciences Medical Clinic. Call now, 786-600-7005. Neurosciences Medical Clinic, 786-600-7005, 786-600-7005. And now we continue with Amy Cabo and The Cure on 880 The Biz. Welcome back to the show. For those that are tuning in, this is The Cure, and I'm your host, Amy Cabo. If this is your first time tuning in, today we are joined by Dr. Melissa Duder, and Rich Whitman, and we're talking about mental illness and the challenges of addiction. Now, my sister, who is a retired detective, wants to ask one of you guys a very interesting question. Hi, Doctor. I was very interested in what you were saying in terms of the information you gave out, which is quite informative and a little shocking in a sense, although I have been aware of all this information that you have mentioned from my years in law enforcement. I was wondering, why is it that kids today are conning their parents, basically, and saying to them, oh, it's natural. It's something that's been around for years. It makes me more creative. It makes me think better. I relax. I chill. I can sleep. Mom, everyone's doing it. And plus, it's legal. And I know the legality of it is the big question because the deterrent was incarceration. The deterrent was law enforcement. Now, in five states, it is not. But why is it that what you have just said is not widespread? Yeah, that's a really good question. I, I, I think um, I've had that discussion with a lot of parents. And what I tend to, to uh, believe, and I don't know that there's a lot of evidence to be certain, but um, is that marijuana, unlike other drugs of abuse, was never really used as a therapeutic. So there wasn't medical research available about the side effects and risks. And so everything that's out there is kind of from the movement of uh, pro-marijuana that came from the inside of marijuana users, sharing information on the Internet and, and so forth, websites and things. But it was never subjected to the kind of research that we have for cocaine or for uh, heroin or even for alcohol because all of those substances were studied um, rigorously because they had been used within the medical profession as treatments. So I think that might be part of the reason why. So I really appreciate that answer. So the irony of this situation is that we are glad then that some of these states legalized it. Now they are a Petri dish. And now there can be the same type of studies as we have conducted with cocaine and the harsher and harder drugs that everyone knows about, and this can maybe contrast what the propagandists are putting out there, because I'm concerned also about the brain development and the brain changes in adolescence that are coming out in studies, and I guess they're necessary. So I guess this evil is going to have a good result in the end, just hopefully not too late. Well, we do hope so, and this is Rich Whitman. The thing is this, that marijuana is not legal anywhere, any place for anybody under 21. Well, we know how that goes. (laughs) No, and I I understand neither is alcohol, neither is tobacco. The thing is, is that many times parents approach me and that it is with kids under the ages of 21. And, yeah, it is natural. It does grow, and, you know, God grows it and all. But you know what? He grows poppies, too. And, you know, what do we do? What happens with poppies? They say, you know, it's not damaging or anything, but, my golly, you know, the THC content in marijuana today is anywhere from at least 10% to 
60, 80 percent more powerful than it was 30 years ago. Exactly. And, and what that does to the to the the neuroplasticity of a young person's brain who is still trying to develop is horrendous. I have seen kids who are just dumble dumb. They cannot carry on conversations because they've smoked much marijuana. Well, let me, let me be a little bit of the, the other side here. So the same applies to alcohol, if you think about it. I mean, maybe it's not going to lead to schizophrenia later on, but uh, definitely not very helpful for kids. And it's obviously illegal, so people just need to follow the law. doesn't matter where you, which state you are, marijuana is illegal. And I would go further as a as a psychiatrist. I would recommend that um, that we teach our kids to avoid the use of recreational substances for mind altering purposes until uh, after age twenty five. And there's several reasons I would recommend that. I know that kids are not going to do that, but if it's our standard, I think it le- it at least helps push that line back okay. until. The- becomes less vulnerable and that's for marijuana alcohol tobacco all of it that's my recommendation to families that we teach them 25 and above is the line and hopefully just get them to at least delay to 21 well doctor since you're a psychiatrist I, I understand that you know marijuana has these things and there's all kinds of different drugs that kids can be exposed to regardless of their environment or what they've been or what they've been taught, or what they believe. What I wanted to ask you is about the kids that suffer from depression, or they've been abused, or something like that. They may be more likely to turn to drugs, and I see that you specialize in early-stage psychiatric care. Could you tell me a little bit about how important that is? Yeah, I mean, I think early on, the very best evidence for the treatment of something like depression in a teenager is counseling. The most helpful intervention that we can provide is not any psychiatric medication. It's certainly not any recreational substances. The absolute best evidence is that when your 14, 16, 18, 19-year-old teenager comes and says they have a problem with anxiety or depression, the safest, most effective treatment for them is the wise counsel of a trained professional who can work with them on healthy coping skills. And um, so I would even advise not jumping straight into, you know, uh, using chemicals in the brain of any kind, but sort of holding off and going for learning skills and uh, developing tools when those things have evidence that they work uh, not only as well, but better. Wow. I'm so impressed that you're one of those doctors that actually don't (laughs) advocate a lot of medication. Thank you. Thank you for being on the show. And Dr. Whitman, I see that you're the founder of the Whitman Recovery Service. Does that include adolescents? And tell me about those services so that people may be aware there's help out there. Sure. Whitman Recovery Service, I found it. I I worked in treatment and all of that for a whole lot of years and helped run treatment centers and helped uh, start treatment centers and, and those type of things and worked for others for the treatment center. Okay. You know, when I, and I'm, I am also in recovery. I, I walked into recovery October 6, 1982. Um, it was a lot of years ago. Now, I didn't walk in that because I thought, wow, that was a great thing to do. Um, I didn't go because I saw the light. I went because I felt the heat. So, I, after working in the field for a lot of years, I really knew what God wanted me to do, and that's work with families on an individual basis. And nice. being able to say, you know, this modality would best fit you. Well, you can't really do that when you're working for another treat when you're working for a treatment center or you're running one. Right. That's what you're working for. Now I have prestige of listening to people, individuals. Knowing the field as I do, I can truly say, you know, I really, I'm hearing what, you, what you're telling me. I'm hearing what you're saying. I really think that this treatment center might make the most sense for you if that's what you needed or this outpatient. Or, you know, have you have considered talking to a 
a psychiatrist like Dr. Ditter or a therapist, outpatient treatment, so on and so forth. So that was one of my big uh, reasons. And as far as interventions, I've been doing interventions since 1983 from a man by the name of Dr. Vern Johnson with the Johnson Institute. He trained me. Nice. And, yeah. So I've yes, done go ahead. Them for a long time. Nice. And I have so many questions. I don't even know if we even have enough time. You guys are such interesting people. But this is for the doctor because uh, how to differentiate serious illness from normal brain development. I would like to know that. Right. How to differentiate uh, serious mental illness from normal brain development. So, you know, as a psychiatrist, so I went to medical school and uh, trained in the treatment of all illness, uh, all the way from, you know, surgical removal of gallbladder to reading x-rays and EKGs of the heart to the whole gamut, and then specialized in psychiatry where I trained for an additional four years uh, and, and then went into private practice of psychiatry. And so the answer really is all of that in the same way how does a, a you know, emergency room doctor differentiate chest pain that's from anxiety from chest pain that's from a heart condition. Um, there are patterns in the data, there are tests, there are reams of, you know, textbooks and information. And um, I think I have an interest in the normal development part because I do think that we've moved away too far in my field into kind of a biologic view that there's a pill for everything <laughs> rather than looking at things like, um, oh, you know, this person's going through a divorce or this is a first semester college student who's just left home or this is a sixth grader who's just gone through puberty. And all of those changes in life in the body and the brain have known effects. And I think we need to come back to um, not just measuring symptoms like depression or anxiety, but measuring sort of uh, the normal for this population, for this person at 12 or 19 or in the midst of a divorce in order to get back to the roots um, and not treat normal life emotions as disease. So it's best to bring the kid to the psychiatrist to see what the case may be, correct? But we're coming up on a break right now, and when we come back, we have very interesting questions for you guys like what are mental health needs, and how does illness become an identity? For anyone that is just tuning in, this is The Cure. I'm your host, Amy Cabo. We're joined by Melissa Duder, Dr. Melissa Duder and Rich Whitman. If you suffer from persistent depression, call Neuroscience's Medical Clinic to schedule a free consultation for new effective FDA-approved treatments such as intranasal ketamine or Neurostar TMS, a no-medication treatment. Neuroscience's Medical Clinic. Call now, 786-600-7005. Neuroscience's Medical Clinic, 786-600-7005, 786-600-7005. And now we continue with Amy Cabo and The Cure on 880 The Biz. We're back, and thanks for joining us. I'm Amy Cabo, and this is The Cure. Our call-in number is 305-541-2350 if you'd like to call. I played that song. I love that song. God is my saving grace. And I've met plenty of, I've met people in my life with halos, two of which have joined me today. Doctor... I wanted to ask you, Mr. Whitman, you as well, because I know that, um, well, let's start with you, doctor. You say that illness can become an identity, your identity. I think I've seen that, but can you tell us a little more about that? Yeah, so we're talking about a little earlier in the show about how brain development affects the onset of a mental health condition the treatment for a mental health condition and, and uh, the effects of substances on the brain like marijuana or alcohol. And in the same way, development can affect uh, how people think about an illness. So if you develop uh, any kind of illness, that can be a medical illness like juvenile diabetes, and, and that happens when you're a teenager or a young adult, you might have a very different relationship to, to any illness if it starts when you're fairly young. 
because in the period of time uh, when you leave your family and come into your own adulthood as a young adult, that's when you decide sort of who you are, what you believe about yourself. So if that includes some sense of having an identity around an illness, um, you can incorporate that. For example, you know, I am bipolar, someone might say, or, you know, I have chronic anxiety. There are things I'm not able to do. And so we have to be very careful not only getting people to the right treatments, but we have to be careful what we teach them to believe about themselves mm -hmm. when they've suffered because it's, there's more to a person than their disease. Most definitely. And, I mean, we even hear it with individuals saying, What's the first thing we ask someone? What do you do? Okay. You don't really come up to an addict and say, what do you do? Um, they, but yet it does become part of their um, identity. I'm a heroin addict. What did you expect? Um, this is who I am. The low self-esteem plays so much into it. Why can't I break free? Especially when they're raised in, in that. Um, you know, it's... Addiction follows uh, patterns and many times follows right out of the family pattern. And it becomes, yeah, their, their identity. Right. And it's, you should not let your condition or whatever you have define you. I do believe that nothing is impossible as long as you have God in your life. But I was very blessed. I didn't need an intervention. God reached out to me different ways through people, through animals, through posts, through songs. He always made himself available but how about those that need an intervention? Yes, doctor, I wanted to ask a question of you first. When you say that children or the development, developing brain affects the way children and young adults perceive their identity in reference to their illnesses, can you t give us some advice for the parents out there who have children with juvenile diseases and conditions? How do parents play a role in preventing the children to form it as an identity? Or to fall into addiction, because it goes hand in hand. Right. So, you know, this um, gets to the heart of how we end up here today. So Rich and I came together working with families of young people who, had, who have addictions and mental illnesses. And this is how we came to become colleagues, is that I have this psychiatric clinic where I'm trying to help individuals uh, in an outpatient setting, and Rich has become my go-to colleague when we need to find someone placement in a treatment center, whether that's for addiction or for mental illness. And we've co-authored this book, A Vision for Change, How to Help Someone with Addiction or Mental Illness. For all of these reasons, because I think it starts with the right care up front, mm -hmm. the right diagnosis, the right treatment, you know, counseling when counseling can be the right course rather than jumping into medications. It starts with the right treatment center, and it starts with healing the whole family. One of the things that we've talked about and is written into this book that we worked on together is the idea that, you know, when a person in the family is sick for a sustained period of time, the entire family now has to go back and learn to be well as a family system, not pathologize that loved one who has a diagnosis, not label that person right. as, you know, their their disease process. And so I think that the, the, the key for families is to understand that the healing is not the individual. It's the entire family, be that for mental illness or for addiction. That's a great point. I'm really glad you brought that up for parents and families out there who are facing that situation. And in the situation where the loved one in a family member needs the intervention, Mr. Whitman, you said you felt the heat, not the light like Amy did. You felt the heat, meaning you were forced into it. For those addictive people who are forced into an intervention, at what point does their cooperation or lack thereof play a role in their success? Or do they ever have to be cooperative? In my case, jail was a really good intervention, but I understand not everybody <laughs> goes through that. So what can you tell me in reference to, do they have to be cooperative or willing for success to be achieved? Good question, thank you. And intervention is a process. See, your process was, hey, guess what? You're going to go spend X, okay? 
uh, you went to jail. The many intervention starts well before I ever walked through the door. The intervention started with mom, dad, husband, wife, um, bringing up the fact that like you drink too much. You you know you come home late, and when you come home, you're sitting there with a six pack and you're drinking all night. And I'm tired of it. And I'm this. Uh, those are forms of interventions. They just mm-hmm. don't work. The one of the things that I like to talk to pay, to to families about. Again, it's a process, and we don't force people into anything. I try to pull them with a vision rather than push them with the family's or my uh, purpose. You know, pulling them with a vision is much better. When we walk into a family and we're going to intervene, it, it's gotten to that place, I have the family tell them all the wonderful things that they have done in their life for the family. This is so great. You have done X, Y, Z, A, B. But someplace along the line, something's something's come in and it's taken my wife away, my husband, my daughter. I love you. And I just want to see that person. I'm just asking you to please accept the help that's being uh, offered to you today. Now, that's pretty much a quick scenario of how uh, the intervention process goes with myself, but nobody is forced. The if to tell me that I have to, or you're going to kick my butt on the right. street, means that fine. I'll go to keep you from kicking my butt out on the street. Now, many times that that works because you can't hang around the muddy creek long enough without sliding in, right? That's what we say, <laughs> you know. The uh, so the we there we're trusting the process, and with that, and lots of times when I have an 18 to 24 year old, and to use a phrase, they're sticking needles in their neck. Guess what? We're going to do whatever it takes to put them into a safe environment because they're going to die. But Mr. Whitman, what if you're someone like me, and an intervention for me would have made me feel like an animal? you know, trapped in a corner, I would not have done well. For me, I I actually had to change my outlook in life. I, I, I had to learn things. Like I had to learn that I had to be grateful for what I have, grateful for who I am, grateful for where I am. Uh, I had to be disciplined. I listened to spiritual songs. I read stuff that is helpful. I pray as much as possible. You try to work harder. If you exercise, is even better, even though I don't get to do that yet. But take care of everything you have, your pets, your house, your family. You get what you put in. And you'd be surprised how much more your pets love you if you spend time with them. How nice it feels to walk around in a clean house. How nice it is to have harmony in your family and have happy friends. And if you take care of things, the more you take care of things, the more you show that you appreciate it. When you take care of your dogs, you show that you appreciate them. And you have to treat everything with love. And that what was helpful for me is that I knew that when I was doing drugs, I was a different person. I wasn't who I wanted to be. I wasn't there for anybody. And I was seeing how it was hurting my family and those who loved me. So that was my intervention. And, and, you know, and that's a lot of people. The thing is, if our brain is completely clouded, we need to clean it up. Before some, I can't pull someone by logic whose brain is thinking illogical. If you are totally clouded, if indeed there's a veil before you, and through that veil it's blocking you, if you will, from the sunlight of the Spirit, from God. You can't see God because you're blocked from that. This disease, as far as I'm concerned, is very dark. There's a dark side. Yes. I am in front of, of families and, and, and people who are addicted and all that. I'm not against that. I'm not against those people. I am against the principles that run around in the darkness that are trying to kill them. I felt like I was living a hell, seriously living a hell, which brings me back to the question I wanted to ask you. Do you integrate God? And how can people help themselves and others? Absolutely. I mean, you know, the, 
when you when you were talking, you know, like First Corinthians fifteen twenty three, I can quote it where it says, "Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good, you know, good character." Right. Right. I know that one. <laughs> Pardon me. Yes, I know that one. Right, and the then you know and 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 we can we can go on. I wear a bracelet that says that. I can do all things in Him who strengthens me. True. So do I. Do I. Do I use. Do I integrate the power of God? Absolutely. We, the people that I work with, I I do co-intervention. Some. I don't go into a family by myself. I bring a. There's myself and always a female partner or a young male or a uh, partner or a young female partner, depending upon the family themselves. The family See, dynamics, yes. Uh, so we come in uh, as a pair. We, we ask the family every time. The, are you spiritual? Are you religious? Do you believe in? I find it extremely helpful because I tried everything, every drug, every medicine, every therapy, transcranial magnetic stimulation, you name it, kind of mean. I've tried everything, and truly, the only thing that worked for me was God, hence the cure. But, guys, thank you so much for being on this show. Thank you, my sister. Thank you, Bobby. You guys have been great, but it's the end of the show, and I wish I could spend more time with you guys. But thank, thank you, you, Dr. Duder, and thank you, Mr. Whitman. Yeah, thank you so much for, for allowing us to enter your studio, if you will, and talk to your people. We really do appreciate it. Thank you. I love the purpose. We're all in it together. And a big thank you to all the listeners. And thank you to Dr. Melissa and Richmond for being on the show. And for more information on Dr. Ruder and Richmond Wizard can be found on amycabo.com under guests. This has been The Cure. I'm your host, Amy Cabo. And thank you for listening. Life can bring many difficult situations. Domestic violence, addictions, poverty, and even sexual abuse by your loved ones. The issue is not stay there, but to overcome all obstacles and show that with the love of God, your husband, and your family, you can succeed. Love is the answer. God is the cure. Reveals from a very sincere and honest position, Amy Cabo's life. A warrior who didn't give up and achieved the dream of her life. You can get to know more about her and her story on www.godisthecure.com or buying her book on Amazon.com. If you suffer from persistent depression, call Neurosciences Medical Clinic to schedule a free consultation for new effective FDA-approved treatments such as intranasal ketamine or Neurostar TMS, a no-medication treatment. Neurosciences Medical Clinic. Call now, 786-600-7005. Neurosciences Medical Clinic, 786-600-7005, 786-600-7005. The Cure with Amy Cabo was brought to you by IMIC Research, 786-310-7477 or www.godisthecure.com. Tune in every Friday at 2 p.m. for The Cure with Amy Cabo, right here on 880 The Biz. Diab-